Hello, and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. Hello, and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened. Joining us on the show today is Tori DeVito, who's best known for starring in six seasons of the hit NBC series Chicago Med and for her work on other shows like Pretty Little Liars, Army Wives, The Vampire Diaries in One Tree Hill, and several great Hallmark Christmas movies like the upcoming Christmas Promise. Her film credits include The Right with Anthony Hopkins, Killer Movie, Amy Makes Three, Cold, and Evidence. But this amazing and talented actress isn't on the show to discuss her impressive career, but rather her spiritual work. Tori's mission is to bring knowledge of wellness, spirituality, and philanthropy to as many people as possible. She's an advocate for women and animals, practices spirituality, and incorporates consciousness into every aspect of her life, from her cruelty-free makeup choices to vegan fashion and eco-conscious sustainability. Tori has studied and trained with energy healers and meditation teachers. She's certified in Reiki, yoga, and the Akashic Records, and is currently studying astrology. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tori. Yeah, thanks for having me. Can you start us off by telling us how you came to this beautiful journey of self-reflection and beauty? Yeah, um, you know, I actually, I think it uh, started when I was younger, unbeknownst to me, I was always kind of exploring and searching for a deeper meaning to things when I was a kid, which I think in uh, some ways kind of alienated me a little bit. Um, But through that alienation, I feel like I had time to really self-reflect and not a negative alienation at all, but just more so of feeling a little misunderstood by peers or family when I was trying to explore certain things. It was like, oh, ha ha, you're so silly. Or what are you you talking about now? You know what I mean? But not in a negative way, just they didn't have the answers to the questions I was asking. And I think I grew up, um, I would go to church on Sundays with my family. Um, We went to a Baptist church and then went to a non-denominational church. And I always had so many questions that um, most people would just say, you just have to have faith. And I was like, "Mm, I don't know that that works for me. And so it kind of took me into um, a self-exploration of everything. I wanted to learn a little bit about Buddhism and all this other stuff. And what I kind of gathered from that was just really connecting myself to spirituality. You know what I mean? Taking little bits of everything and kind of exploring life through the eyes of uh, spirituality versus organized religion. And that I found really, really worked for me. So you came into the world as a seeker is what you're saying and an old soul in a young body. Yeah. I love that. One of the things, Tori, that you've been really open about outside of your amazing and prolific career is working with mental health agencies and your own struggle with anxiety and being an empath. And do you find that the spirituality has given you a balance for all aspects of your life? Absolutely. I I think that if I didn't believe that there was a higher entity that I was connected to that we're all connected to. And if I didn't believe that we were all connected to the same thing and all connected to each other, I think a lot of the paths that I've taken would be a lot more difficult or just completely not manageable in itself. I don't think I would be able to walk a certain path that I've gone to without that kind of connection. And, um, I think that's helped me, you know, I, I had a lot of anxiety, especially in my, um, like later teens and, uh, young twenties had a lot of anxiety and I felt a lot of depression. And I actually started identifying with that, especially as an artist. And I was afraid to do the deeper work because I was afraid if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be a good artist anymore, which is a massive misconception. But, um, but yeah, I think that, showing up for other people who I feel like are struggling with anxiety or mental health issues the way I did when I was younger, or, you know, showing up for uh, a group of people to talk about sexual assault and consent and all that. If I didn't have the spiritual work or meditation, I I don't think I'd be able to do it. That's such a good point you make showing up because 
you talked earlier about feeling kind of not isolated and alone, but just different with your questions and your seeker's mind. And you add adolescence to that and depression and anxiety and all the stuff that comes with, you know, for most of us being that age, then that's more <laughs> isolation. But when we show up for each other, that's really all we need to do to hold each other's hand and, and help walk each other home. Absolutely. You know, I th- yes, that's what's so interesting. I feel like people think they have this idea that, oh, I'm going to do spiritual work and my life's just going to illuminate. And it's like, yes, but it, it gets really like, it's like when you ask for something to be healed, when you show up and say, okay, I'm ready to heal. I'm ready to forgive myself, others, whatever it may be. It is messy at first. And I think people don't realize that. And I think that that's kind of what happened to me when I was younger. I was like searching, searching, searching. And that alienation kind of put me in like a little bit of a darker space and kind of put me in like, you know, a bit of an angsty space because I did feel so misunderstood and I didn't understand so much. And I wanted to know so much. And it was just like, and I'm this heap of confusion, a big pile of it in my lap. And I'm so grateful for it because it led me to so many different places in my mind and even in my physical body. And I remember I was very, very like depressed uh, when I was like 24, 25. And it's funny when I say that, I feel like a lot of people wouldn't know that because I feel like on the outside, I'm very um, extroverted, but on the inside, I'm very introverted. And I think that's why it's so important to destigmatize mental, mental health because people often don't know that some people who show up with a smile, who show up, you know, looking sociable and stuff can still be struggling so much on the inside. But I, I was in like, kind of like the thick of it when I was like 24, 25. And I was on this TV show and I was so excited because I felt like it was the first time I was doing a show that people would actually see. And it felt like a really big moment for me in my career. And I was so miserable. I was on set and um, it was a lot of uh, uh, specific personalities that it just felt very fearful to me. And, um, and, and I was inside all day, not connecting with nature and just in reconditioned air all day. And I just was so down. And I went on the internet to like volunteer my time. I thought if I could just get myself out of my own head, maybe that'll help me. And that's when I found hospice work. And what's funny about that is everybody in my life was like, well, you're already so depressed. Like, how is this going to help? You're going to be around people that are dying. And I learned so quickly that being with people during that moment of, to me, that's like a birth for them into a new phase of whatever is next, you know, that we all don't know. But um, it was such a light in my life because whenever you're feeling confused and so low, when you put your attention on others, when you show up in love in that way, you take the, the, the lens off yourself for a second. And it, it helped massively. Like, I can't stress that enough with mental health, like getting out of your own head and putting your attention on somebody else and giving and showing up in love is just like, I think the best thing you could do for a dark space. I could not agree more. I read an article that you had written about hospice and that you started that in your twenties. And absolutely love, love, love the way you had said, walking someone to the next phase of their life. And, you know, I have a, a friend who was a baby nurse for years and she's, and I saw her and I, she said, oh, well, I'm doing hospice now. And she said, Denise, I welcomed people onto the planet for years and now I help escort them out. And she yeah. said exactly the same thing that you just said, Tori, that there's such a, a reverence and a peace and um, a sense beyond yourself and being able to be a part of that. Absolutely. To me, it's just like one circle of life, really. It's just a recycle, repeat, recycle, repeat, really. You know, you're, I, say, I used to say that all the time. I was like, it's kind of like being in um, a hospital setting when somebody's giving birth. It's very similar uh, to me in that way. And, you know, nobody deserves to die alone. And when you have hospice volunteers around, normally people are alone. So I just think that work is so important. And I wish we could take the negative uh, kind of haze that hospice has over it. Because a lot of people I talked to were like, that sounds so scary. I don't think I could do that. And I was like, oh, if I could just explain to you how not scary it is. But I also know it's very specific. You know, not everybody wants to or could do, but, but it's, but it's just, it's, yeah, it's so beautiful. Did you have any experiences with people talking about seeing their loved ones greet them on the other side or 
interesting you know, last words? I didn't, but the one thing that I love uh, about hospice work, and I and I remind myself and my boyfriend um, of that all the time. Whenever we're, you know, talking about work with each other and stuff, I always go. The one thing everyone talked about who was lying on their deathbed, they wanted to talk about who they loved, who they regretted not loving, their family, travel. I never heard somebody talk about their job. Not to say that jobs can't be fulfilling because I know mine is so fulfilling and I love my job, but nobody sat there on their bed going, I wish I would have worked more. I wish I would have made more money. (laughs) Not, you know, and I did this, I do this for years and years and years and I never heard that. It was all about regrets in not loving and uh, triumphs in love. And I just think I always try to remind myself of that when I get stressed out about work or if I feel like I'm missing too many family or friend occasions because I'm putting work first too much or something. I remind myself of that. I'm like, when I am lying there, what is going to be important for me? What am I going to want to be telling the person that's sitting next to my deathbed? And it's not going to be, oh, you know, I really skipped too, uh, too many, uh, not enough Thanksgivings for work. You know what I mean? It's like, no, that's not what I'm going to say. So, um, that really, that, that always sat with me. That is such an important reminder. So you mentioned working and being in that, you know, kind of windowless recycled air environment. And I, I don't know Hollywood. I haven't worked with actors, but I would imagine it would be kind of a lot of different energies. Some might be competitive or egocentric or just all about their own work. As a spiritual person, how do you balance that on your on a day-to-day basis? Do you meditate before work? Do you ground your energy? Do you do Reiki on that? What do you do to balance that? Yeah, you know, I actually, um, it, it kind of changes a lot with me. I feel like uh, <laughs> if you believe in astrology or not, I feel like it's a very Gemini trait of me. Um, you know, we know a, um, a little about a lot. <laughs> and so I feel like I'm always, I love learning new things, right? So I'm always like trying to learn this modality and trying to like learn this new energy healing and whatever. So it's definitely changed, but I do try to have a morning routine, which to be completely honest, has always been very difficult for me because no matter how many 5 a.m., 4 a.m. wake-ups I've had in my career over the last 20 years, I am not a morning person. And I always try. And I and then I catch myself beating myself up. I'm like, why couldn't I have just set my alarm for 20 minutes earlier? And I'm like, because that would have been me waking up at 3.40 in the morning. That's impossible. But, but yeah, I do. And then I actually talked to my favorite energy healer that I've been working with for years, Janet Raftis. I love her so much. And I was like, sometimes it's so hard for me to wake up and meditate in the morning. And she was like, even if you're just in the shower and you imagine like the shower just being a golden light of protection over you and you take that moment in the shower, I was like, oh, that's so beautiful. And I learned that not everything has to be so structured, but if I do have the time I will try to do 20 minutes meditation in the morning and then 20 minutes in the afternoon. I love um, TM meditation. But lately, my um, main focus has been, I promised myself that I would get through my year of the workbook for students in the Course in Miracles. And I've, I've tried it a couple years and I've only gotten to like day 30. And I am on day 68 or 69, which I'm very excited about. And I am going to make it the whole year. And it's, it's a commitment. You know, I don't know if you know much about the Course in Miracles, yes, but I've yes. done the same. I'm also a Gemini and I have stopped and started that book. I know right? what a commitment that is. Yeah. That's fantastic. I love it. And for me, it's such a great reminder and has also made a lot of stuff come up for me. Like I said, when you ask things to be forgiven, you can bet everything that the universe will put everything in your path to trigger that whatever you're trying to let go of or forgive. And I have found this work to be so beautiful. And so A Course in Miracles lately has just been my main focus and just really focusing on love and that connection and remembering that we are not separate. And that is what causes a lot of depression and anxiety. We are are all one. Forgiveness being the main crux of the course, which that for me has always been, um, I think, the hardest learning path. Because I always thought, what do you mean forgiveness? So I could just 
forgive someone for coming in and spitting on my floor and then it's just okay isn't that being walked all over and it's like actually no <laughs> no forgiveness is the most powerful thing you can you can learn and you can give and receive so that work has been really beautiful for me and i find that that really grounds my day and then the check-ins all day because in the course of miracles they you have little reminders you have to remind yourself all day that has been very very powerful for me those are great suggestions that is a powerful that to me the reading the book even if you don't do the workbook just the book itself is life-changing absolutely yeah I am I haven't gotten through the whole text yet and then I said you know what instead of trying to get through the text first I'm going to do the workbook first because the the course says it doesn't matter which book you start first. You just have to start from page one and go through or whatever. So I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to try the workbook this year. Really commit to doing it. And I, I can't wait to get back into the text too because I found it through um, Marianne Williamson's book. What's it called? Return um, to Love. Yes, Return to Love. And I remember reading that book and being like, what is the Course in Miracles? This sounds exactly how I think, but... I've never been able to put words into it. Like, this is amazing. So I feel like that's a great place to start if you're like curious about the course, but it looks a little too dense or a little too scary at first. Starting with her book definitely inspired me to get into it. You know, what's really cool is that I just read the latest uh, brain research and it takes 66 days to make it a habit. So damn oh. straight, you made it and you are on yes. the other side. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. That's good to hear. <laughs> so do you find that you blend the spirituality with a lot of the, all of the, the um, board of directors that you're on and the, the work that you're doing? It's not light and fluffy stuff. It's very heavy. It's very it, it's to my my gut feeling is that all of this work is to empower other people to connect more fully with their own healing, with their own inner knowing and light, and and it's beautiful. But like your your safe bay work with children or young adults who have been uh, victims of sexual assault. Uh, I've worked with teenagers and young adults for years, and I don't think people realize the impact that this has. And and would you mind talking a bit about that? agency? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, um, God, Safe Bay has been really life-changing for me. I got involved with them about five years ago. I watched this documentary, Audrey and Daisy, which is on Netflix. And I highly recommend people to watch it. It is very difficult to watch. Um, but it lit, lit such a fire under me. And, um, I reached out to the girls from the film and I saw that they had started an organization called Safe Bay Together when they were like 17 because they had all been sexually assaulted at 14. And um, and I've been working with them ever since. And what I love about Safe Bay is when I met them, I said, you know, I don't, I will do these things for you, but I don't want to just send out an Instagram post or a tweet or show up to like an event. I want to do the work with you guys. I want to show up to schools and talk to kids about this. And that has probably been one of the most rewarding aspects of my career, that my career has allowed me to show up in these spaces. And I just recently did a whole three-day tour through Rhode Island, and we went to about eight schools in those three days. And one school, 300 kids showed up. Another school, so, so Safe Bay, we have this curriculum that we bring to schools if they want it. And it could be a student that reaches out or a teacher or whatever. Um, we will come if we're asked to come. And it's a curriculum basically to help kids navigate and teach about sexual consent and sexual assault. It has everything from bystander intervention to Title IX. Like it, it's it's a whole it's a whole buffet of things and and it's really user friendly and it's just such a great thing. And and we would love to get it into every school, but obviously it's a very scary subject for a lot of schools to to talk about. So they kind of like look away at first, but some schools are very inviting. There was even one school that really wanted us there and the teachers wouldn't allow us to come. So the students reached out to us and they said, if we rented a room in the library, would you guys show up? And we were like, yes. Yeah. So me and this woman, Shale, showed up and there was 30 kids from the high school that showed up because they wanted to learn this material. And I, I just thought that was so beautiful. I feel like these young kids are yearning to do better. And I think that's why I got involved. I was in a very odd high school. I grew up in Winter Park, Florida for my formative years. I was in a school where there was 4,000 kids in the school, in my high school. It was a lot. It had a very, uh, it was, it was 
very challenging. It, it, it was, I didn't have the easiest high school experience. And I had something that happened to me. And I remember once I learned about this work thinking, why didn't I know this material? Why didn't I know where my no was? Why wasn't I empowered with this knowledge? Why didn't I know my rights? And I was so upset for the young person I was that I didn't have this information, that I made a promise to myself that I would never meet another young kid again who is going to get past me without at least knowing that this information is accessible to them. And so it's, it's kind of beautiful because it's like, if I would have known this information, I would have gotten out of a lot of sticky situations. And, um, but had I known this information, I wouldn't be where I am to be able to share this. So, you know, being grateful for the path and being grateful for all that is definitely something that's very important, but yeah, it's like, it's a, it's, it's really empowering when you watch these young kids come up and they just want to learn and they want to know this information and they want to do better. I had a group of girls that were probably in sophomores or juniors at the oldest. And they said, we loved what you guys talked about. And we realized that not only do the school administrators need to be better when sexual assault is reported, but we as kids need to be better. And that starts even with girl to girl slut shaming, like that starts rape culture. And we, we need to stop that. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like you guys are so powerful. You don't even know it. So, um, the safe is probably my, my favorite work that I do right now. Well, and it also covers uh, all gender preferences, all yes. relationship types, all, and I think it's even more vital now than it's ever been because of the mixed messages that uh, younger people are getting hit with. It's beautiful, <clears throat> beautiful work, and I love that you brought up that it's not just happening in big cities or rural areas. This is everywhere, and it's everyone, and I don't mean that as a, a fear-based thing, but I love that you're giving children and young adults the, the tools that they need to realize that there's other options so thank yeah you. and that is that is the thing it is everyone and we definitely start the um every talk by saying you know we understand that in audrey and daisy the one place it failed is it makes it look like a male versus female conflict and it's not no. one in four boys will be sexual assaulted and one in six girls and it is boys too and and boys and all male identifying genders need to be a part of this conversation just as much as female identifying people and I think boys do feel very left out of this conversation right now and I do think they feel very very confused and that's why we are always searching for more um, male identified people uh, to talk to young boys because you know we don't want to make it like it is it is it covers everybody yes that's the important thing is talking about it you know I, I feel like there's such a secrecy around all of this whatever type yeah. of assault we're talking about when you add the sexuality to it people don't want to talk about it I had a student in my English class and they had to write a narrative paper on an experience from which they learned something. And most wrote about their first job or their first breakup. And this one girl wrote about her uncle assaulting her. And it was a beautifully written paper and I gave her an A and we were talking about it. She said it was the first A she got. So wow. that holiday season, she read it aloud to her family. Oh, and wow. Three other family members came forward and shared their experience. Wow. And she said, if I hadn't read that paper, you know, those three and two of those three girls were underage. So, so it was just this transformative experience for her and for me. And it reminded me that so few people talk about this and it, it needs to be talked about. And I think when people see someone like you, that they, I mean, obviously we don't know you, but when you, when someone's on your TV screen so much, you feel like you know them. Right. And they feel like, oh, if Tori can talk about it, then I guess I can too. And that's, right, right. that's crucial. Right. And, you know, that's so funny that you say that about nobody wanting to talk about it because Shale, um, so Shale and I are the two, we joke the two adults <laughs> on Safe Bay because we do try to make it a youth led organization so that when we're making these videos, kids don't feel like, oh, another set of adults trying to teach us about, you know, 
sexual right. assault or whatever, like, like or sexual consent. Like, no, we, everybody on the board is under 25, except for me and Shale. You have to have, <laughs> we kind of like are the two adults and they don't let us like take care of the content. You know, they want it in their own voice, which is great. But Shale actually said something so powerful to me. And it's hard to even say this to a lot of adults. It kind of like weirds them out. But she said, um, I was like, why, why wouldn't every school want this curriculum in their classes? I don't understand. And she said, because it's scary for adults. We come from the generation where it's just brushed off. Like things like that are just a bad date. Things like that don't get talked about. And she said, and it's scary for them because if you talk to kids about consent and assault, you also have to talk to them about pleasure. And most adults do not want to talk to kids about that. And I was like, oof, that is very true. <laughs> I get that. So it is a scary topic, but you're right. It does need to be talked about. And that's so powerful about, you know, reading that letter around the table because, I mean, I don't know anyone who either hasn't been in some way harassed or assaulted themselves or at least knows somebody who has been, you know? But it, again, it's just not talked about. I remember when uh, Kavanaugh was up for Supreme Court, I remember what a big deal his whole background was. And I remember I was sitting with a bunch of my girlfriends and we were talking about all of it. And I can't tell you how many of my friends were like, I had something weird like that happen to me at a party in college. And someone yes. else was like, yeah, I did too. And nobody, we've been friends for years and nobody knew all these different stories about inappropriateness um, yeah. that ranged on the spectrum to very inappropriate. Absolutely. And you know what else is crazy? And that I learned, and it took me, I had to process for like a while when I learned this. I went to this play when I was about 26, maybe. This woman who played my mom on the first show I ever did, Daphne Zuniga, she took me to this play called Slut the Play. And I sat there and one of the girls in the play she gets sexually assaulted by two boys, but there was, there was no penetration involved. And I remember they, she said in the play, I was raped. And I, afterwards I said to Daphne, I go, well, they didn't have sex with her. How, how did she say she was raped? She's like, rape isn't just sex. That's sexual assault is not just having sex. They touched her inappropriately. They, and I was like, oh my God, then that's happened to me that wait what that's and I was 26 years old when I learned that and I was like and I felt that I you know grew up in a very progressive environment and this and that and I was like how did I not know that and how many other women don't know exactly what assault is and just brush things off because oh well you know I didn't get attacked in a dark alleyway so I clearly wasn't wasn't raped you know what I mean and, and that really inspired me to do this work too because I was like how many women don't know that or men don't know that too many and then you look at the court systems and how they handle so many of that and there's still a lot of work to be done so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to you for, oh, for you know handling that. all right I have to mention so I'm a huge fan of Billy Joel and I read that your dad <laughs> drummer which I think is absolutely phenomenal so you come from this super cool family and I always think of like artistic people as being I don't know kind of more right-brained and open-minded so do you feel that you were raised in a spiritual environment that allowed you to to seek and ask these questions you know it's so interesting yes I definitely um grew up in a very open household. I know that my parents had no, you know, confines over me as far as my artistic expression and questions. It is funny though, because my mother, my mother is uh, an artist as well. And she is somebody who is, she's the most non-judgmental open person ever, but she comes from a very religious background. And so she and I kind of battled a lot when I was younger because she was told, you know, to believe that the Bible is the truth and you don't question it and you just have faith. But yet she also was from this rock and roll world, you know, going on tour with Stevie Nicks all the time. And that's how she met my dad. And she was so liberal and open, but she had this like, but you don't ask questions about religion. It's just the faith. So we used to go at it, but, but she never stopped me from asking questions. She never told me I was wrong. She just, we would just get into these 
debates. And um, my mom definitely is is more spiritual now. Actually, we've kind of gone through this journey together, which has been really beautiful, but she still has her religious base, which I think is amazing. And we always laugh about how we kind of speak the same thing, but just in a different language, which I love so much because I think to each their own. Um, but my parents both, you know, definitely encouraged me to ask questions and, you know, be who I want to be. And my dad was the same way. Like, you know, I think like you said, when you grow up in like, the artist industry or the rock and roll industry, mostly you have this kind of like more open-minded kind of set of eyes. And my dad was the same way. Like he, you know, is very spiritual. And I think he grew up with, you know, that Italian Catholic base and yeah, they just, I had a very, I, I feel very lucky to say that I had a very open household where I could really explore whatever I wanted to explore except <laughs> when I was really trying to explore and I always felt like I would see <laughs> ghosts in my house in Florida and stuff and when I was growing up as a kid and one day my mom came home and I had all the lights turned off and I was taking pictures in the dark she's like what are you doing and I was like I'm trying to capture the ghost on camera and for my religious mother at the time she was not too pleased about that she was like what are you talking about and then one day I came home and I broke like the major cardinal sin in my house I brought an Ouija board in because I didn't know any better and so I was doing Ouija board in my bathroom trying to connect to the ghost that I thought I was seeing and my mom was so mad at me I think that was the most angry she's ever been at me but but yeah other than that they just they were very encouraging of me to explore self-expression <laughs> I think that's anger from a place of protection, you know, just Absolutely. she was like, what have you done? What are you doing? You can't get that out of this house. I was like, what's wrong with it? It's made by Mattel. I don't get it. Why is it so bad? She's like, get it out of here. That's hilarious. <laughs> so the music part, because I, I mean, my sons are both very musical. I grew up with music. I love it. You obviously grew up with in another realm that most people have never had the experience of. I think it's that same energy, though, of the universal healing that we're all trying to step into. Music is a beautiful gateway to that. Yes. And do, do, do you play for pleasure as well as professionally? Um, I do. Uh, so I grew up playing violin. I started when I was six. And uh, I grew up really playing a lot, playing professionally throughout my teens. I played with the Florida Symphony Youth Orchestra during high school. I um, And then as I got older, when I first moved to LA, I played with some artists. I played on Stevie Nicks' last album. I played on um, Raphael Sadiq's album. And I did a, sh a comedy music show that Tommy Davidson, the actor, had put on and played a song with Brian McKnight's band behind me. So I got to do some really cool stuff with it. But when acting kind of caught my attention, I I kind of put violin behind acting. And it's kind of been that way ever since, which... I love that you just said, do you play for pleasure or, you know, professionally? Because I have to remember that um, I think what's hard is when you grow up playing an instrument, especially a classical instrument, right? There's no room for improvisation. There's, it's very strict. It's very to the books. And I took it so seriously that now if I'm working too much and I don't play, like I haven't played probably in about eight to 10 months, which is the longest I've ever gone. And I also had like a bit of a shoulder injury this last year. So I really couldn't play. And I'm now scared of it versus oh. picking it back up again and saying, oh, this is something beautiful that I love to do. It's like, no, I'm not going to be as good as I was when I was younger because it was so serious to me. I don't allow myself to play with it sometimes, but remembering that, yeah, music is very spiritual and it is very connecting like that is helpful but yeah I haven't played I need to get I need to start playing this this conversation is going to inspire me to pick it up again <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think too that I, what I've seen for a lot of folks that are highly sensitive or struggle with anxiety or any of those things music can be such an incredible way to express emotion and to really Absolutely. tap into that so yeah um, it's beautiful I hope you do play again because it's thank fun. you <laughs> Well, yes. You're making me feel a little lazy because you do you do <laughs> all this stuff with your work. You do work with hospice and you work with 
sexually harassed been young people and you work with PETA. I mean, it's just absolutely phenomenal. What are you, what are you doing just for your own soul? Is it nature and your farm? Like, what are you doing just, just for Tori? Um, I read a lot, which I love. Um, I also um, have recently gotten into cooking and baking, which has been a lot of fun. My boyfriend is uh, not a vegetarian and not vegan. And so I have a lot of fun trying to find like his favorite desserts and our favorite meals that I know he doesn't eat vegetarian and trying to like make them vegetarian to see if I can make them just as good as he likes it without (laughs) all the meat in it and stuff. So that's not easy. It's not. And it's, but it's so much fun. So that kind of stuff, like taking a day, the thing is, is that I can go, go, go. But if I have a day when I know I don't have to do anything, I'm really good at shutting off. That is one thing I'm good at doing. Just even if sometimes like I I love reading and I love the cooking, but sometimes I do just want to put on a mediocre TV show and just lay in bed all day. And I think sometimes people go like, oh, you know, but I need to be learning or reading a book and this and that. And it's like, I allow myself that. I'm like, yeah, maybe that wasn't um, very intellectually stimulating. Maybe that wasn't very spiritually stimulating, but my body needed that rest and I am going to take that rest. So that's the kind of stuff or just sitting outside or going on a walk. I love finding like nature trails in whatever area I'm in, stuff like that. That's what I do for myself, really. That is the best. Have you heard Ellen Burstein talk about her shouldless days? No. He has this wonderful talk she gives on how I think once a month she schedules a shouldless day where there's nothing she should do. And I always try to embody that at least once a month myself. It's not easy. I know yeah. before I had kids, um, my hus- my former husband and I, we would always have, we would call it our bed day and we would just stay in bed an entire day, one day a month and just watch stupid TV. <laughs> that was I love easy. that. I loved it. Oh, there's that's nothing, so beautiful. There's nothing like that. And I think you bring up a good point though, because taking care of yourself doesn't have to be reading the course of miracles and meditating and doing Reiki and yoga. Taking care of yourself can be laying on the couch all day and watching fun, frivolous TV. Right. Exactly. You know, it's so funny you say that because I always felt like even with spirituality, I would wake up and, and you know, my job makes it so that I have to travel a lot and I used to think oh no like what crystals am I going to bring on this trip what tarot cards do I want to bring on this trip oh shoot I forgot this book I forgot this so I can't do my spiritual practice I don't have the right things and again that woman Janet Reftis I was talking about my energy healer I work with she said she's like you that stuff is great to add on but everything you need for a spiritual practice you have I can meditate anywhere you like she said in the shower whatever you can do all that stuff and so even for the self-relaxation days like like you just said you don't need to be doing all this stuff you don't and even on the days that you want to be spiritual you don't need all these books and you don't need all these crystals around you could literally just connect with going outside you know whatever it is putting your bare feet in the ground touching a tree I love communicating (laughs) with nature in that way you know Oh, I do too. But you said my magic word crystals. So I'm (laughs) I'm a huge crystal lover. What are some of your favorite ones that you tend to take with you when you do travel? Um, My favorite. So I, there's a stone that I love. I, I feel very, very spiritually connected to Lake Michigan. And I didn't realize that till later in my life. And, um, my farm is in Michigan now. And I just, I love Michigan. I don't know. I mean, I kind of grew up going to Michigan every summer. My mom's family lives there, but they live uh, in Kalamazoo at the time. And I don't feel very connected to Kalamazoo, but I do feel connected to Lake Michigan. And there's this Petoskey stone from Lake Michigan. Yes. I love the stones. I love that stone. That is like my go-to stone all the time. And then I also love, um, what one is it? Oh my gosh. How am I blanking on it? Oh, peach, uh, peach moonstone. Is that the one? Oh yeah. 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 It's like a very feminine stone. Yes. I love that one. The uh, listener sent me her stones from Lake Michigan and she sent me this beautiful letter and said, my son and I collect these all the time. And I was like, what? They're just, I've never been to Lake Michigan. So do you just find them as you're walking along there? You know what? 
So I haven't. My mom has. I've never been to Petoskey is actually a area in Michigan. I've never been there to collect the stones myself. My mom has, and she had one, and it looks totally different than the one I have because obviously mine's from the inside of the stone and the outside looks totally different. So my mom has that, and she um, said she was going to give that one to me. But I actually found in the area that I have my farm, there's actually a couple really great stone crystal shops. And there's this man, he actually just closed up shop. I'm so disappointed, but he makes jewelry from all this stuff. And I went into his shop a couple times and that was the first time I found the Potosi stone. And you know how it is when you see, it's like, you can feel the vibration from across the room and you're like, connect with a crystal and you walk over and you pick it up. And it's almost like it was calling your name and you're like, what one is this? Why am I drawn to this one? And then of course you read all about it and you're like, well, no wonder I was drawn to it. So that's kind of how it happened. That's exactly, it's like like meeting a friend and you just know they're going to be friends for life. Yeah, that's the best feeling. And that's, I always tell people too, I'm like, what's crazy about that too? When they're ready to be released from you, they will. And I'm like, so I've had friends be like, shoot, I lost my favorite stone. I'm like, it needed to go. If you need to find it again, it will find you, I promise. But right now it needed a different home. So you know what I mean? Don't stress yes. about losing those either. Cause I feel like they leave you when they need to leave you. I totally agree. I can't imagine having the platform that you have and, and having all the interest and passions that, that you also have. And I'm sure there's even so much more what are you hoping to do with all of this? I mean, is there a book in you? Is there a makeup line? In you? I just feel like something's getting ready to be birthed in you. <laughs> I love that you say that. Um, that has been a lot of my main focus uh, actually right now. And it's scary and daunting because I don't know what it is. I know it's coming and I feel it. And I love writing. And I write poetry all the time, but I also love wellness stuff. And there's so many things brewing in my head that um, it's about me just kind of focusing and narrowing it down and down and down until it comes. And I'm in one of those spaces where I'm trying not to push too hard or stress myself out over it. And just every day, just be open and say, you know, where will you have me go? What will you have me do? What will you have me say and to whom? And hope that the path kind of illuminates of what exactly I'm meant to be focusing on and narrowing in on right now. But but yeah, I definitely um, see something with writing, see something with a book too in the future. Um, that is the goal. Yeah, I can see that. Almost like, have you read Dr. Andrew Weil's Eight Weeks to Optimum Health? No, no, it's such a good book. It's old. It's like from the mid nineties, I think, but it's a great book. And that's what I see you doing. Cause it's almost like a workbook. Like it has recipes in there. It has like um, healthy things you can eat and healthy habits for your mind, body, spirit. But I, I feel like you would be so good putting that, all that together or like even just a list of, you know, vegan free makeup lines we could all get on board with. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm writing that down right now. You said it's called eight weeks to altering health. Optimum health. Optimum health. Okay. I'm going to get that. It's really good. I loved it. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Just really quick, because I know we're running out of time. Sure. With your connection with PETA and being a vegan, do you find that uh, that level of empathy, because I, I have talked with a lot of folks with behind the scenes in, in your industry, and so many are sensitive, kind, and they bring their little dogs with them. And I'm just wondering, do you find that that's another aspect of what you're doing? that you, you really are that, that connection with animals. Yeah. Yeah. That connection with animals. Um, my animals definitely keep me grounded and bring so much joy into my life. I actually got the farm that I purchased in Michigan with the hopes of turning it into a uh, dog hospice one day, but uh, I have to figure all that out. But, uh, but yeah, I always feel like the animals that I have in my life, they've all come to me and found me. I've never gone out looking for them. And that's kind of how I trust that they'll all find me. But, but that, that is hard. It's hard. I kind of had to stop now that I have the information and what goes on behind closed doors and a lot of different, you know, factory farming industries and um, all that stuff. I kind of had to stop watching those videos for a second because it really, 
it hurts. It takes a toll. Yes. And so I feel like having a voice for the voiceless like that is something that's really important. And that kind of translates into living a cruelty free life for me. And I never judge anyone for doing anything, right? Like I said, I don't have many vegetarians that are my friends. <laughs> I don't have many vegans that are my friends. A lot of my friends, all of my friends, I think wear leather. And, but for me personally, I don't, I, I don't wear leather. I don't, by products that have been tested on animals because I feel like that goes into it. For me, you can't I can't just adopt a dog and then go put on a leather jacket that killed a cow. Do you know what I'm saying? Or right. I can't eat a veggie burger and then go wear a crocodile bag. To me it's all kind of encompassing. So that's been my promise to myself is kind of to walk in those cruelty free shoes as much as I possibly can and adoption dog adoption is definitely something i'm passionate about as well a very moral compass for you yeah that is yeah it's it, that that compass it helps keep me tethered you know i i had said to my boyfriend recently i said you know sometimes when i really really stay focused on my vegan diet you know cuz i'm always vegetarian because sometimes i slip up with you know dairy but um when i try to focus on my vegan diet i said to him i was like I don't just feel lighter physically. It's not about my physical body anymore. I feel lighter in my soul. I, was like, I just feel like I've done something right for myself. And I know not everybody feels that way. And that's fine. But for me, that's kind of, it just makes me happier. I've, I'm filled with so much more joy when I know there's not a creature that's been harmed by my walk in that day. You know what I mean? I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but. No, not at all. It sounds absolutely beautiful. And I know what you mean. I've never heard of a hospice center for dogs. Right. I know. because well, It was kind of inspired. So I started working with Paws in Chicago. It's an adoption agency in Chicago. And I went to one of their galas and I spoke at it. And again, it was like that crystal vibration. I looked over in the corner and there was this little dog with a cone around her head and somebody was carrying her and there was dogs everywhere. I don't know why I zeroed in on this dog. I told my cousin who was with me that night, I said, I got to find that dog. It took us 20 minutes to find her. And she was 12 years old. She had horrible ear infections, had been completely neglected. Um, come to find out, I didn't know this. She had was riddled with cancer and she was this crooked, quirky, perfect, like uh, so odd and looking that she was so cute and she just like literally got into my heart. And when she passed, I only had her from, for a, a little over a year. She was 12 years old when I got her and I just fell in love with this dog. And I got this farm and I, I named it after her. I named it Dear Twigs. It's like a love letter to her. And I named it Dear Twigs Farm. And I said, in honor of her, I want any dog who cannot get adopted to come live out their last years here. So I feel like I have to follow through with this in her honor. But like I said, it's just about kind of figuring out all the pieces because I'm not there full time. So I have to figure that out. It'll come all together when it's meant to. That's such a beautiful idea. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I got, I wrote her, I wrote her a little love letter when she passed and my mom was like, you have to frame it in the farm. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to name it Dear Twigs. It's like a love letter to her. I was like sobbing. My mom was sobbing. It was, it was so silly. <laughs> oh, I love that. We have a listener who sent us a, po a photo. Their friend's dog had died and they got a new puppy and they were feeling kind of, you know, you feel a little guilty about that. Yeah. And they took a photo of the puppy and there is a perfect white light outline image oh of their distant dog standing next to the puppy. It is, oh, God. I know, I love it. I love, oh, it. I love that so much. Oh, that just gave me chills. I feel like that, oh, that stays with you, right? Like that, I remember the night that she passed, um, I had to... I had to get her, uh, put her down. The doctor said her quality, her, she couldn't even open her mouth anymore to eat. The cancer had paralyzed her mouth and she was just not doing well. And my friends left me in twigs. We had, I said, can I please do it tomorrow so I can have one last night with her. And so my friends left me this care package outside my door. And after she passed, I was in Chicago at the time. I drove two hours to Michigan to be with my mom because I didn't want to be alone. And my friends had left us this care package for me and Twigs. And in it was a, a framed picture of the two of us. And it, they got me this crystal that they felt like was good for she and I. And I was sitting on my couch 
And I kid you not, I said, oh my God, mom, because the picture was next to the crystal. My dog's ear, even though I had to get an ablation surgery for her, which removes the whole ear and the ear canal, her ear was still so um, horribly like, like uh, the skin was just couldn't be healed because the uh, ear infection had just infected her skin so badly that it was just pussy and it was just bad all the time. The crystal and the picture of her ear were identical and it looked the same shape as her ear and the same color on the inside, except the crystal was like the healed version of her ear and the picture had like the bad version of her ear. Like it was literally, I, I wish I could, I could send you this picture. I was like, oh my gosh, they got me the crystal. And I felt like that was twigs showing me that now that she's passed over, that is what her ear looks like now. She is healed and she is healing. And then I went outside to let my other two dogs out and I looked up and there was the moon and there was this huge white circle around the moon that I had never seen before. And I was like, oh, twigs. <laughs> it was so amazing. It's like she was saying, I love you to the moon and back. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you so much for coming on and, and thank you personally for upping my cool factor because my <laughs> team daughters have loved you since you were Meredith on Vampire Diaries. Oh my gosh, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> we're all going to watch A Christmas Promise when my oldest gets home from college. So thank you for this. And for all the beautiful work you do, I just, I can't wait to see what's going to be birthed out of you in the next few years. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It was lovely talking to you guys. You too. Have a great holiday season. And thank you everybody for listening. Please remember as always to show up, do great work and share your light. Yes. Take care. Bye.